Hello again. Uh, today we're going to be talking about logistic population growth. So if you recall, we recently just learned about exponential population growth, where we said, you know, you can start with just a very few individuals, and if you allow these individuals to reproduce given their rate, you can have this growth pattern that is this J curve that gets steeper and steeper and steeper, right? But I want to ask just a couple questions to get us thinking as we move through the lecture of today. So can a population grow exponentially forever? Think about that. Can it go on? Can any biological population grow forever? And can a population grow exponentially, though, for maybe a little bit of time and then taper off? Okay, so as you think about those, think about those questions as we go through the lecture today. So remember that we talked about the rabbits, and initially, um, we when we had this the, our, our last example, we kind of set it set up the numbers this way that the the rate was 0.8, and so we went from 10 to 18 to 32, and we kept increasing, 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 and this was using you know the exponential growth um, uh, formula that we came up with, the equation, but um, we went uh, if you go and actually look at the numbers from this population. It turns out that the numbers at first are kind of matching, but then they kind of don't match the numbers from the exponential growth equation. And in fact, it seems like they kind of start to just be about the same here towards the bottom, just in the mid 600s. So what's going on? Why is this population being limited, right? And we can look and, and see there's a huge difference between the expected curve. So if I were to plot out this over those 12 to 13 generations. Here's the expected numbers, the exponential growth equation numbers. And then the real numbers, though, are kind of this red line right here. So what's happening? What's limiting the growth? Well, we call these limiting factors. And there are, uh, there are two kinds. One is called density-dependent factors. So these are factors that come into play and grow in influence as the population density gets larger and larger. So some examples of this that you could probably come up on your own are things like, you know, the territory, the space, the food, uh, where are you going to put your waste, you know. So it's all of these resources. There's just not enough resources to go around. And so what you end up with is something kind of like this where, you know, these fur seals that live on this little island uh, where they breed, um, at first they were, they were low in numbers because they had been hunted. But as laws were put into place where you couldn't hunt these, these seals, then the, the population numbers began to grow and grow and grow, but then they started to taper off and taper off and taper off until they kind of flatlined. And obviously the main um, density dependent factor in this case is the fact that there's just not enough room on this little island for lots and lots of breeding male fur seals. The other kind of limiting factor is called density independent factor. This is a factor that comes into play regardless of the population density. So it doesn't matter how big or how small the population is. They are factors that, uh, that influence the size of the population independent of how big they are. So an examples of this could be things like you know hurricanes, floods, tornadoes. Or in this example over here, these are aphids. And um, aphids actually reproduce, can reproduce both asexually and sexually. Um, but when they are in their population boom cycle, they it's typically um, a cloning that's happening. You've got females that are just cloning and cloning and cloning, and you get this huge increase in aphids. You've probably seen this on some of the plants in your garden. Um, and they could have kept growing more and more, but maybe, you know, all of a sudden you have a, a really, really cold morning, and so it just kills off a ton of the aphids. And so you have a, a huge decline in the population, right? So there, there are factors that are both density dependent and factors that are density independent. So now let's come back to our equation. Remember our equation, we said that the change in the population size um, over the change in the time, right? So how bigger, how much is the population increasing over from one generation to the next was equal to the rate times the population size. So this equation fails to predict the growth pattern that we're seeing in this observed data. So should we just throw out this equation or could we modify this existing equation and kind of uh, uh, you know, tweak it a bit. Well, the best answer is actually we can take this current equation, which has really good things about it, but then tweak it so that it reflects more of the reality. 
So there are limits then on, on populations because there are limits in all of these resources that we talked about. And so that actual limit or that cap at which a population could grow to is called the carrying capacity. And we represent that with the capital letter K. So remember we had kind of this deviation between the exponential growth and this kind of observed growth. That flat line at the top of the observed growth, that's what we call the carrying capacity. Okay? And this kind of growth we call logistic growth. So the carrying capacity then is simply just the number of individuals in a population that the environment can just maintain with no net increase or decrease. So if we take that carrying capacity capital K and think about it and how this might work into our equation, we can say, okay, well, how much room was there to grow? And to do this, let's simplify this. Let's say we have a population of 100 individuals, okay? So that's our K. Our, our, our flat line on the top of the curve here is 100. And let's say that the current population size, n, is 75. So how much can we grow? Well, 100 minus 75 is 25. That's the room to grow. And we can write that as a percentage. 100 minus 75 divided by 100 would be 25%. So we have the p potential to grow 25% of the carrying capacity. Um, if we do this with uh, another example, let's say that k equals 600 and that n, the current population size, equals 250. So it's 600 minus 250 equals 350. And we can write that as a percentage as well, where we say that 600 minus 250, which is 350, divided by the total, the, to the k, um, which is 600, equals 41.7%. So if we write this generically, you can see now we've kind of worked out this, how do we incorporate capital K or the carrying capacity into our equation. Well, we've got to do something like this where it's K minus N all over K. Now with this, when we are at, down here at this part of the curve, then we have lots of room to grow. And we're up when we are at this part of the curve, we don't have a lot of room to grow. Um, but when we're down here, we also don't have a lot of population, so the growth is slower. And as we get up here, as we move al along the, the, the curve, when the population size increases, now we have lots of population, and, and, and with that room to grow, we can actually grow fairly quickly. So if you, if you say at 10% of the carrying capacity, you have 90% room to grow, then you can grow at 90% of your rate of growth. And at 90% of the carrying capacity, though, you only have 10% room to grow, so you're only going to be growing at 10% of your R. So that's why you see kind of this room to grow modifier that happens in our equation. And so to do that, we now have the, we can put all of this into our, our, our equation where we have the change in, in population size over time is equal to K minus N over K times the rate times the population size. And when we do this, it ends up with that S-shaped curve where you kind of start off slow and then you hit kind of this, this middle region of the, of the curve where you're, where you're growing at your fastest rates and then you kind of slow back down again because there's not a lot of room to grow. And if you map out the amount of individuals added in each generation, you see that the greatest peak is right at half the carrying capacity. That's when growth is happening um, at its greatest speed. So finally, I want to talk about predator and prey. Predator and prey are um, interesting um, because they, ca they can be part of density dependent, but they also could be part of density independent. In this case, we're going to look at um, um, the example where it's density dependent. And this only happens when you have a predator-prey relationship that's really tight, where for the most part, the predator only preys on the or only eats the prey, and the prey for the most part is only eaten by the predator. And whenever this is kind of the case, when you have this kind of tight relationship, you'll see this cyclical nature of the predator and prey, where in this case the blue line represents the rabbits. As the rabbit in population increases, increases, the fox population right behind it, now it has all of this prey that it can eat, and so it increases in size. But as soon as it gets big enough, it's now um, able to take down and eat a lot of these rabbits, and so the rabbit population quickly declines. And then there's not enough rabbits to go around, and so the, the fox population starts to decline, and so forth, and so you have this cyclical nature. So some of the factors like disease, 
um, and things like predator-prey relationships. These can be either dependent or independent variables of, the, of limiting the population size. And a lot of it just depends on how tight the relationship is between the organisms. Or is this, you know, is this disease a, a type of disease that um, you know, as it, it spreads and it, and it spreads in such a way that if the population is really large, then you're going to have a large proportion of the population get sick. Or is it the type of the disease that it doesn't matter whether, you know, um, you only have 10 individuals or a million individuals, you know, the disease is on, you know, on average going to kill half of the individuals. And so that would be a density independent um, factor. So the, some of the factors are clearly density dependent, some of the factors are clearly density independent, and then some can kind of be in, in between, depending on what the particular relationship between the, the host and the, and the parasite, or the host and the disease, or the predator and the prey are. So that's a quick introduction to logistic growth and to this um, density, to, to the fact that populations can't continually grow exponentially forever, that something limits their growth.